Thank you. My name is Drew Dawson and I'm an alcoholic. I used to think that would be the hardest thing to get up in a room and say till I got involved in firefighting when I had to get up and say, hi, I'm Drew Dawson, I'm a social scientist. And it's been a very interesting journey. <coughs> I'm really interested in why people do dumb shit. And it's been really interesting. You've heard a lot today about the technical aspects of what we know about firefighting, what we know about houses, the nation of the fire, how the fire behaves, how the property behaves. What's really interesting is that human behaviour in the context of fire is remarkably unpredictable. And that is people don't behave the way we do it. I'm endlessly amused by the CSIRO and the research scientist people who come to us and go, we gave people all this really good information and they didn't follow it. I'm going to make a quick, I guess, bid today to say the new Bushfire CRC has made a very major commitment to trying to understand the social aspects of fire and in particular to understand how people perceive the risks associated with fire, how people value the landscape and their sense of community and how that shapes their subsequent behaviour. There's been a lot of work done in the last couple of years, as you will know, which says sometimes people do dumb shit because they're rescuing their pets. We don't yet really understand very much about the way in which people perceive the risk associated with fires, the way it mo mediates or modulates the way they respond. We don't really understand the role of community in changing the way that fire is responded to. And I think I'd like to talk to you about a couple of the key projects that are starting to emerge out of the um, Bushfire CRC, and most importantly, how you within the South Australian context can hopefully play a part in helping us. Um, my father, who was not a researcher, said that the most important value he could communicate with, to me was that people should have, or people were given, two ears and one mouth in that ratio for a very important reason. I'm quite new to fire science and particularly to the human side of it. <coughs> and over the next couple of years we have a couple of quite interesting projects which I think will be of interest to many of you within the audience. The first of these is a series of projects that are looking around how people's perceptions of risk are altered by the landscape in which they live and in a sense the different ways that people look at the landscape in which they live and in, in many ways how that can hold mutually contradictory values. As somebody who lives in the Adelaide Hills, I can have the local CFS people come around and look at my property and they go, oh, and they see fuel everywhere and problems and what I have to do. And I have seen situations where people have said, if I wanted to live in the suburbs with no trees, then I would live in the suburbs. I've chosen to live in the hills and that the landscape and the trees have both positive amenity, but they also have negative consequences in terms of fuel load. One of the things that we know about risk perception is that the risk for people in the professional firefighting services is that they see the risk all summer and they know there will be fires and they will need to deal with them. At the micro level for me as an individual house owner, the risk for me is incredibly small. Most of us will never have a contact with a major bushfire, even if we do live in the Adelaide Hills or those kind of areas. And trying to understand how the individual levels of risk perception alter our behaviour and how the communication of that risk between the professionals working in the field to the individuals within the community is going to be hard. We have projects with the Bushfire CRC starting which will be starting to try and understand the role that fire prevention agencies will play in terms of community development. Many of you will be aware that the characteristic demographic of volunteers has been characterised, I guess, as pale, male and stale, to use the current language. That is, as with many emergency services, we have 50-year-old men of a very traditional role and set of responsibilities and that we are now trying to recruit into different generations who have completely different values. I've been involved with several brigades up in the Adelaide Hills and have seen that there can be quite remarkable differences in the way that those brigades run. In some brigades you can see them as highly successful community development 
organisation who is playing a critical role in bringing the community together as participants in fire prevention. And in other parts of the hills you can find it's kind of Boy Scouts and not much more. It's going to be really important in the next few years to start to understand the notion of how we attract people into firefighting, how we make the community a very significant partner in it, how we change the culture away from waiting to be rescued to being an active participant in a fire prevention process, how that shared responsibility models that we've heard about earlier play out. It's going to be really important to understand how communities think about the risk and how they choose to allocate resources. We had suggestions last night in the conversation where somebody said, well, it would be really easy to fix the problem. All we have to do is, and it doesn't matter what the particular issue was, in this particular case, it was a yet another example of just throw money at the problem. But the difficulty is that there are limited resources in the community and we have to have difficult and sometimes hard conversations about what our relative priorities are. How we actually facilitate those processes and how we get communities to understand what's a reasonable expectation. What should I be doing as part of the fire prevention process? Is it reasonable for me to live in certain places? Well, if I don't expect you to come and rescue me, maybe it is. What is the role of the state in regulating the extent to which people can or cannot assume risk and how do we control that? I think the next generation of fire research from a social sciences perspective is going to be extremely interesting, not just in terms of understanding the community perceptions, but also in how we move forward and in understanding the workforce. We have issues around how do we recruit the next generation of volunteers? How do we further educate the professional firefighting operators around the country? How do we create national standards so that individuals can move in an interoperable sense? And I know that's a very bad word in the industry. But in the same way as your fire pump hose coupling can be interoperable, maybe our incident management teams have to be so that when there is a big event somewhere else, we can move people across very quickly and deal with surge capacities in those kind of ways. And I know a lot of that's already going on. But how we understand the process of managing the human factors within the agencies is going to be the other big area that we're looking at. I have a particular interest in the notion of how we manage surge and how we manage catastrophic events. I've done a lot of work in other industries where we've been looking at how catastrophic events are managed. And what's very interesting is that there is, in many of the emergency services industries, a sense that catastrophic events happen and we just deal with them as they come along. In many cases, they're actually far more preventable than we think. It's actually the case that many of the catastrophic fire events we'll face over the next three years, the next three to ten years, will be highly predictable based on the work that CSIRO and many of the other researchers have done. How do we manage our incident management teams across a three-day event? What kind of processes and organisational structures do we need in place so people can actually work for extended periods like that? It may not be the ways that we've done it in the past. So I think there's going to be a number of challenges over the next few years, which is that I think fire, society and how we interact between those two is going to have to reinvent itself in a lot of ways to change, to deal with the changing demographics, to understand the nature of how community influences that and most importantly how we increase the level of professionalisation and the level of sophistication and education in our workforces working in that area as well as the recruits and how we develop the community as active participants in that. I don't want to say much more than that but to encourage you as members of the South Australian community to try and actively engage with the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre. We are only as good as the people we engage with and frankly the vast majority of the expertise and experience is actually sitting out there and not with the guys sitting over here. Our job is to help you translate, our job is to help provide you with the tools, our job is to help to provide you the techniques and approaches to make sure that what you do is as good as possible, as cost effective as possible and as safe as possible. So I'd like to take this opportunity before we throw it open for questions to say get involved. The CRC has a fairly big representation in South Australia. I'm one of the principal scientific advisors to it based at UniSA and our door and telephone is always open to you. Um, Conversely, when our researchers come out, can I encourage you to take the time to actually listen and say, how could I help them? 
And sometimes it's going to be difficult. Sometimes it's inconvenient. Sometimes you have to go that extra mile. But think about as an investment in the long-term future of the industry and in terms of building capacity. One of the big industry issues that we're facing at the moment is how do we build the research capacity? The recommendation, as many of you will see in the Royal Commission in Victoria, was that there should be a national research institute into fire sciences. That's going to need a cohort of graduate and PhD students and academics. They're going to need access to work with you and the people in the industries and the communities that you have access to. And the only way that we can actually build that capacity as a community is actually through the goodwill and engagement of you guys. So I'm going to leave it on that note. Thank you very much. And I